So um, please, please accept my apology for that. And thank you so much for joining me this afternoon to discuss the anatomy and functional morphology of dragonfly nymphs. I would like to begin with a short video, which my husband made about uh, six weeks or so ago now. We went out to the river near our house and he put on his scuba gear and grabbed his underwater photography and got out the equipment all in shape. And I went out and dip netted the Stylurus amnicola nymphs or the riverine club tail as it's called in the sandbars and sandy shoals of the Kishwaukee. I dropped them back into the water and he swam like crazy downstream as these nymphs just tumbled and bumbled in that very fast current. He eventually captured this particular footage as one of them came to rest on its preferred substrate. And I think as you watch it burrow under the fine sand and silt here, you'll be able to see it all but disappear. Watch as its dorsal abdominal pattern simply dissolves into its surroundings. And I think that this video in part highlights the subaquatic microhabitat of this particular species, but that it also speaks to the old adage that form follows function and to the fact that many dragonfly species are inextricably linked to quite specific aquatic niches, even within the realm of their larger waterway or wetland. It also brings to mind the fact that there's plentiful or abundant opportunities to, um, to do research and, and study these um, microhabitats because in actuality, very little is known about those, um, those niches. So let's begin by first recalling the life cycle of dragonflies and the fact that they are hemimetabolic aquatic insects, meaning they have a three-part metamorphosis from egg to nymph to imago or adult, as opposed to holometabolous insects such as Lepidoptera, which go from egg to larva to pupa to adult. And if we quickly break down the amount of time that is spent in each of these stages. After oviposition, eggs usually develop within one to three weeks. That is if they don't enter diapause in order to overwinter. And the nymphal stage then lasts anywhere from five weeks to five or more years. I think the average is probably uh, a year to two years in, in our area anyway. And that depends on the particular species and environmental conditions. And of course, the adult sticks around what, on average, two to six weeks, uh, depending on weather events and predation. So the point here is that dragonflies spend the majority of their time under the water as nymphs, and therefore the nymph is the thing. The nymph is where it's at. Let's now take a quick look at early development before we consider specific anatomical structures. Just before an egg is ready to hatch, the main features of that soon to be nymph can actually be seen through the eggshell or chorion. Here is an elongated egg. That's typical of those species that, that oviposit endophytically, that is in vegetation. And you can see the eyes, mouth parts here, the legs, you can see the caudal segments curled around, even the anal pyramid. <clears throat> They're all visible. If we look at ellipsoidal eggs, which are more typical of, of exophytic oviposition, you again can see all of these nymphal structures. This is a ventral view where you can see the eye spots, the antennae, the legs, et cetera, dorsal view and lateral view. If we look at this video of an, an epitheca embryo just a day or so before it hatched, you can see these structures again, the antennae and eye spots, legs and so forth. As it twists and turns, they're very active sometimes. Notice um, not just the, the, the structures of the nymph itself, but that orangish yellow yolk sac that eventually is incorporated into the midgut where it supplies the energy for the first few hours to few days. 
after emergence until that nymph begins to successfully capture its own prey. So the sequence of egg eclosion begins when the embryo gulps amniotic fluid and pumps it up towards its head. And that little noggin swells and it splits through a fine seam left by the mother during ovipositioning along the anterior pole of the eggshell. And you see it begins to come out. In fact, it pops out into what is called a pronymph. This is the pronymph. Um, that pronymph is actually the first instar, but it's not a, a functional nymph yet. It, it's considered the first instar. It cannot um, walk like a nymph. It can't forage like a nymph. In fact, it can't do this because it is stuffed like a sausage into a skin. And so this is a pronymph of a different species, but you can see its mouth, uh, lower jaw is pushed down towards its belly here. So are its antennae. You can see their legs, the legs, but the whole body is, is restricted by this tight cuticle. So within just moments, sometimes less than two minutes after breaking through the egg, that pronymph is going to have to molt in its first ecdysis or ecdysis. I don't know if there's any other Doctor Who fans out there besides me, but I find this resemblance just remarkable. Within that minute or two of breaking out of the egg, the pronymph begins its molt. And here you see it's broken the cuticle, it's pulling its legs up out of that tight skin. It actually, once it gets its legs up, it pushes down on the skin, leaving the first exuvia behind. That's the pronymph exuvia or the, ex the skin of the first instar. And what emerges is a second fully functional instar capable of locomotion and feeding. Again, it's got the yolk sac incorporated into that mid gut to help it until it's hardened its cuticle and really can start going out in search of prey. And depending on upon the species, second instars generally range between one to two millimeters in length. Here's the entire sequence, a more detailed sequence of events um, depicted on this slide. And if, if you look here, um, as the pronymph begins to to writhe, still usually attached to the eggshell, you'll see that it starts to pump fluid up to its dorsal thoracic segments. Do you guys see that dorsal thorax swelling up there? It swells up until it ruptures the, the skin. And that's a stratagem it is going to use for all of its following ecdyses which are gonna be somewhere generally on average between 11 and 13 times until it reaches that final instar. In fact, it uses that, that stratagem for um, eclosion into the adult too, doesn't it? Okay, so here's an Epiacea heros, a swamp darner egg right before eclosion. Here it is after it's hatched. And this little cutie patootie is a two millimeter long second instar. At this stage, um, it's got very small mouth parts and at just two millimeters, it's got to have a prey size that's pretty tiny too. And I've had a lot of problems coming up with the, the right size protozoa and small um, aquatic invertebrates that are not too fast or too small or too large for this to grab. And you don't wanna waste uh, a lot of time capturing prey. So what this one just ate is a chironomid or midge larva. Uh, Ken Tennyson published a, a recipe of sorts for rearing chironomid larvae to feed just such early instar larvae because they have a much more successful capture rate. And here it is in low, slow motion. You can see that lower jaw jut out. It's just perfect size. and. I've watched them eat these and they generally don't miss, which is good for energy reserves. Here's that same species, 12 or 13 molts later, 
as a final instar. Some dramatic differences, not just in patterning of, of, and coloration, but in size, because now we're talking about a 55 millimeter long final instar nymph with wing pads roughly back to the hind, um, the, the, the hind legs knee joint of sorts. And this is going to um, get ready to emerge into an adult dragonfly. Here are three Anax junius, a common green darner final instars. The one on the left has wing pads um, back to that hind knee. And those wing pads are situated flat against the abdomen. The middle nymph there, you can see that those wing pads have started to swell somewhat. And on the final nymph to the right, the wing pads are fully swollen at this stage. They're probably not going to eat. And in the next day or two, they're going to draw themselves up out of the water and emerge into the adults. Those wing pads there are so intricately and geometrically jam-packed into the, the um, wing cuticle of the nymph and they're folded so well, but once released, when, when that final ecdysis occurs and they unfurl, they are never going back in. Sort of what happens when my husband packs the trunk of the car to go on vacation and I unpack it at the first motel. The next morning, it's the exact same stuff, but it's just not gonna fit back in. Okay, so now let's discuss specific body parts on dragonfly nymphs and get some vocabulary down. First of all, when you handle a dragonfly nymph, you wanna be sure to look at it from every conceivable angle, even minute structures like the number of CD or hairs on a leg part might be significant for keying that, that nymph out to species. So you wanna look either in hand through a loop or under a dissecting scope very closely at the nymph. Let's see, why doesn't that wanna move? There we go. Um, let's start with the head, which has some of the most significant taxonomic characters to consider. So here we have two examples of heads that were taken off of dragonfly nymphs. Let's look at the eyes first. And the, the size and the position of the eyes, the compound eyes on the head can, um, can be important clues to distinguish genera sometimes. Sometimes they're flattened, sometimes elevated. They may be forwardly set or laterally placed. We we'll wanna pay attention to that. The antennae are another character on the head to look at. And the antennae can vary in length as well as in the number and proportion of their antennal segments known as antennomeres. On the left, you see a seven segmented antenna. On the right, you see a four segmented antenna, which is typical of the family Gonfidae. And, um, and look at the proportions of segment three there on the bottom right compared to segment four. That fourth antennomere is all but vestigial, but the third is quite elongated. Sometimes they can be very broadened. Um, in, in species that have more than four antennal segments, a lot of times they're either six or seven segmented antennae. So here we see anterior views representative of heads of seven dragonfly families. Just take a quick peek at their eyes first and see how different those can actually look. You see how the one, uh, one on top has very small eyes that are elevated above the head capsule and just to the left of it, that Aishnid has very large laterally placed eyes that take up um, the majority of the head capsule. And there's everything in between. And, and now take a look at their forward projecting antennae. You may see, um, let me see if I can get my arrow. Can you guys see that my arrow here pointing to the broad antennal segments here on the left versus some of these very long and sinuous antennae. But perhaps the most noticeable feature is their lower jaw which is what I'd like to describe next. And, and you can see it really well and how very different it is in these ante anterior shots. So I've chosen the head of a libellulate or skimmer nymph as an example. And I wanna just give you the perspective of some of the images we're going to see. So um, we're first going to pull that lower jaw out as you see in the lower image, 
That's what's, what has occurred. And we're gonna take a look at the mouth parts and then we're gonna spin that head around 90 degrees, bring it down and pull the jaw out again so that you can see it from a different angle. So here we have um, the first shot. That was the bottom shot on the previous screen. And we can find all four mouth parts that you would find in an adult dragonfly. They exist in the nymph as well. The upper lip is known as the labrum. The, then we have a pair of mandibles left and right with those large um, tough teeth for chewing. The maxillae left and right below it. And then this lower jaw known as the labium. The labium itself is composed of the more proximal postmentum and the more distal prementum, they're separated by a hinge and extending off the prementum, left and right palpal lobes are simply palps. Here are the mouth parts from the side. We're gonna open up that jaw. And again, you see the labrum, the mandibles, the maxillae, the labium with its left and right palps. Long before humans struggled with this question of masking up or not, dragonflies met the challenge and sorted themselves out. But um, rather than aligning themselves into political camps, they rather diverged into distinct taxa. So I wanna take a look at masked dragonflies and no masks on dragonflies. First of all, the masked situation, as you see here, is known as a scooped prementum. You see that prementum down below that looks a bit like a spoon, doesn't it? And sticking off of that prementum are those palpal lobes. And those palpal lobes now are situated vertically to the point where they're actually masking or covering that upper lip or labrum and the other two sets of mouth parts, the, the mandibles and the maxillae. We see this mask in, um, in multiple families of dragonflies, some of which are the uh, cordulogastrids or spike tails, the macromeids or cruisers, uh, the cordulids or emeralds and the labellulids or skimmers. The more ancestral trait is the flat lab and flat prementum, or in other words, the, the non-masked dragonflies. And here you can see on the bottom that um, the, the upper lip, that labrum is actually visible. There's no palps covering or masking those other mouth parts. Let's um, see, we find, we find uh, this situation in the Aeschnids or, or Darners, the Gonfids, the club tails, the Petalurids, uh, or petal tails, although I think if you spoke to Chris Beatty, he might tell you that that flat prementum is a little different in a petal tail. Uh, and so there's been some evolution acting on that. Here are the two different mask situations on the whole nymph with the labium protracted. You can see on the bottom with that flat labium, uh, how, how it looks a bit, as Philip Corbett once described it, like a serving tray. And on top, that scooped prementum looks like a cup. Those are gonna hold prey either way. If we take a closer look at the scooped prementum here, um, I'd like you to note that that, that scoop has some hair-like seedy extending off of it, and so do the palps. And if we look more closely here, um, at, from a dorsal view down into that premental cup, you can see the, the so-called premental CD and the palpal CD. These are oftentimes important to visualize under a dissecting scope and to count because their numbers can vary um, in between, between species within a genera or within a genus, excuse me. So, um, so they can be of systematic importance, but what is their function? Their function here is to hold and retain prey. Once you've snatched it out uh, in front of you, you pull it back under your head capsule. Those CD can actually just um, descend over the prey like bars on a cage and hold it tight. Okay, another feature of that scooped prementum 
um, actually is on the distal margin of the palpal lobes. If you look here, that distal margin can be uh, scalloped and they can be shallow crenations or they may be more deeply grooved as you see in this image. Sometimes they're so drastically um, altered as in the spike tail nymphs or the cordulogastrid nymphs, we see actual sharp barbs or interlocking teeth on the palps, which, which must actually suit them well since they are growing down in, in stream beds and they capture prey, perhaps in flowing water, they can hold on to it and retain it better. I just know the very first time I ever dredged a, a spike tail nymph out of the mud and looked into its mouth, I thought, oh man, I'm gonna need a bigger dip net. Here now, let's take a look at the flat prementums. Here are a few examples uh, from the side lateral view of that serving tray. If we pull it out and we look a little closer, we see that now the papal lobes are horizontally um, compressed and flattened, not vertically. They send out these palpal blades, which can be toothed and pointed, but those also are horizontal, not covering any other mouth parts. And then you have these sickle-like magnificent movable hooks, which obviously are going to help in the piercing and grabbing and retaining of prey. Here's um, a view from underneath a, a flat prementum. And you can see sometimes those palpal blades are just exaggerated. You can imagine here that this species is tenacious in holding its prey items. When you get to final instar with, um, with species like darners, which have that flat prementum, they need some pretty big prey because they themselves are pretty big. They're ferocious hunters. And at that point, if, if I'm rearing them, I have gotten, so I just throw earthworms in because they'll, they'll take tadpoles and minnows and snails out of their shells. But here's, a, here's an example of this amazing flat prementum with its movable hooks and this Aishna tuberculifera nymph, which I just tossed a large earthworm in. And once it snags it, it does not let go those piercing movable hooks, those daggers hung on to this earthworm for two days while it just ate it alive. And when it was completely gone, it didn't want the, the remnants of it, but it fed well using that flat prementum. Okay, on the thorax, what structures should we pay attention to on dragonfly nymphs? First of all, their wing pads come off the thoracic segments and with wing pads, they can be in the final instar, which is usually what you wanna use when you're keying out nymphs. You, you have divergent wing pads, as you see with these three species, and you have non-divergent wing pads, which are folded over the mid dorsal line together. So that's something to look for. With the legs, pro, meso, and metathoracic um, legs, and on each leg, the femur, the tibia, the tarsus, and the claws, their proportions and lengths may be significant for keying features. On the abdomen, when you look at it, um, there are the 10 abdominal segments, but uh, sometimes there are what are called posterior lateral spines coming off oftentimes just the more posterior segments. They can be pretty dramatic as you see in this nymph right here in segment eight or nine is labeled. You see how sharp and barbarous those can be. Obviously um, dissuasive to a predator. Also on the abdomen, the mid dorsal ridge sometimes has elevated hooks. If we have time, I'll show you some exaggerated mid dorsal hooks later. Um, but Amanda, be sure and call me when you need need to um, stop the, the talk. Some of those mid dorsal hooks actually are sharp on the edges. Others may just be risen up and they may be um, just bumps, but either way that profile can be distinctive 
when you're trying to identify nymphs. And finally, at the very end of the nymph, we need to pay attention to the anal pyramid. And just like with an adult, you have uh, two cerci left and right, the upper or dorsal epiproct and the lower um, paired paraprox that surround the anal valve and the opening or orifice for uh, bringing water in and respiration, as well as the exit for uh, fecal pellets and defecation. So you can see here that anal pyramids can dramatically differ in terms of the portion, proportion and lengths of those, um, those components of the anal pyramid. I just have a quick, I'm, I'm gonna show just portion of this video quickly. This is a video of res, a respiring nymph that has just molted just after ecdysis, the cuticle is oftentimes translucent. And so what you're looking at from above, you've got the, the epiproct is lifted up, the paraprox are splayed out and water is entering that anal valve the branchial basket is that network of tracheal tubes you're seeing around the rectum that in white. And here's a, 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 a close up as it's breathing and it's pulling the oxygen out of the water into those tubes. And those tubes are branching beyond and beyond to smaller and smaller tubes going out to all aspects of the nymph and delivering oxygen directly to the cells. Okay, so now, We've seen the basic structures of all dragonfly nymphs. Let's consider some of the variation in these structures and get to the point of form follows function a little more closely. Um, I think it's, it's safe to say that both biotic and physical properties or parameters of a given dragonfly species aquatic niche exert significant influence on its nymphal morphology. But before we take a look at some of the more remarkable variation in form across dragonfly species, um, I think it should probably be mentioned that derived features are not necessarily indicative of distinct taxa or, or phylogeny. So many may simply be the result of convergent evolution. So categories that I'm gonna talk about that refer to their position in the water columns, such as burrower and clinger or climber and sprawler. Um, please don't, don't think that I am in any way, shape or form implying cladistical significance to those. I just wanna show you derivations of structure that support that, that lifestyle. Okay, so a quick, Another quick video of Progonphus obscurus, the common sand dragon. So last fall during COVID, I went out to a river in central Illinois that, um, that uh, had a lot of Progonphus nymphs in it. And you can see those trails or tunnels. Did you see those on the sandbar just under that shallow, clear water? And I was following those trails with my hand. And eventually, if you do this, you'll get down to the end and you'll be able to pull up a Progonphus Obscurus. There it is. What? So um, this, this nymph is about the only one you're ever going to find in the Midwest on these sandy sandbars in that shallow water in that coarse sand and gravel. And you can see its body type. It's, it's cylindrical and well tapered. Its head is shovel shaped. It's actually just built like a bulldozer for um, burrowing and creating those tunnels in this coarse substrate. And as I drop it in, watch it just disappear. Boom, tunneling down. So we need to take a look at some of the structures that it has evolved to adapt to this type of burrowing behavior. And usually they burrow straight down very, very quickly. This particular one um, was tired because I put this vial on the, the, the hood of my trunk and I did this video over and over. So I was kind of exhausted at the end, but here is that nymph, not that specific nymph, but this is Progonphus obscurus. And if we dissect its anatomy right now, you'll see that it is indeed meant to burrow in coarse gravel. So you've got very short foreleg and middle legs. The pro and mesothoracic legs are very short. They have a short number of tarsomeres in each tarsus and they have keels to their, their, their tibia with sharp bristles coming off of them. 
and they can dig like nobody's business with that. Their head is shovel shaped. I guess, I hope you guys can see my arrow here. Their head is just like a shovel and it pushes downward. Their short antennae also are generally put, pointed downward. They have divergent wing pads, a cylindrical body and an accumulate or tapering um, body form. So they are ideal for that substrate. And they've really capitalized on it because you don't find, uh, you find virtually no other dragonfly um, nymphs, almost no other dragonfly nymphs in that substrate. So they're a burrower. Other burrowers that, that um, like to dig down under the substrate at the bottom of a waterway are other gothids, in fact, and they they oftentimes have the opposite abdominal structure. They're, they have more of a flattened abdomen and they just burrow in just under the surface. And so they've got these, these more wafer thin abdomens. Uh, they don't take that deep dive. And they have these characteristic tibial spurs at, or burrowing hooks here at the ends of their tibia, which allow them to effectively um, move material out of their way. Again, they have those, those short antennae. And here are two other examples of, of gonfids or club tails with shortened legs, and you can see their burrowing hooks quite well. This is also a burrower, but it's not a club tail. It's a cordylogastrid, a spike tail. And I put this in here to show you how very hairy it is. These burrow into the mud along streams. And when you pull them out in the dip net, they are just coated and caked in mud, so much so that they're very cryptic and hard to find. These hairs are so numerous and they undoubtedly have sensory function as well. But what they seem to do really, really well is like a dung beetle, just collect all of the little um, bits of, of silt and material floating by and, and it makes them quite cryptic. A second category as far as position in the water column are climbers or clingers and they like to hang on to um, a, aquatic vegetation, subaquatic emergent stalks, um, uh, immersed overhanging roots and um, waterlogged flotsam and jetsam and so forth. And the darners or aishnids do this. They are what we call thigmotactic. And they tend to, that means they tend to wrap their legs around anything that touches them. And, and so they're grasping it tightly like this um, Anax junius nymph is grasping the pencil I put in the water with it. Many of these uh, have cylindrical bodies like the stems onto which they, they hold fast and stalk their prey. Um, others have very, and, and they can have very smooth bodies and some take on that, like that green darner can take on green and yellow and pink, lovely colors. You can ask Amy Thompson about that. She has some phenomenal colors of Anax Junius that she has seen. Um, so they have all sorts of different colors to blend in. This particular fawn darner or Boyeria venosa nymph tends to cling to um, underwater roots and, um, and it, it is a darker color. A lot of the darners that I, I take off of, of sticks and logs and roots tend to be darker, but also they have, they have rough textured cuticles different patterns even. And when you look at them at first, you're like, wow, that looks just like that stick. That looks just like that bark. Here's an Aishna constricta nymph that virtually, as you follow its abdomen back, virtually blends into the stick I took from the habitat from which I removed the nymph. And, uh, and so the point is you wanna blend into whatever you're perching on if you're, a, if you're gonna be a good predator. Here is a completely different family. This Cordulia, Somatochlora franklini, the delicate emerald, 
um, blends in beautifully with the sphagnum moss in which you find the nymphs. I took this particular nymph from a bog in Minnesota at one of the DSA meetings, and it was just shocking to me. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but there's lots of little hairs on its abdomen, but the color of this nymph is just identical to the um, sphagnum. And it obviously uses this to its benefit because these little guys are very difficult to find. Another category we loosely clump dragonfly nymphs into are sprawlers. These, these don't burrow, they don't cling. They just sprawl on top of the bottom substrate. And um, the family that does this best perhaps it, are the macromiids. They, the macromiids are the cruisers and this macromia illinoisensis nymph looks quite a bit like a spider. So right off the bat, you notice it's got these ridiculously long legs and those long legs increase its surface area um, and its flattened body, it's flat like a wafer, very mottled, allows it to blend in to the, um, to the substrate very well. Like, I don't, I hope you can see this video well enough to see that nymph on, on the cobble there. Um, these, these nymphs I've, I've thrown back in the water and I've watched them sink down and, and if they land upside down, those long legs and long claws actually allow them to flip themselves easily over and back into that, that upward sprawling position, which I don't see a lot of nymphs able to do that very well. So, um, and they're so flat, the water flows over them. They're so flat and the water flows over them. And the truth is they'll stay in one place so long that a lot of macromia nymphs I take from rivers in central Illinois are covered with algae just growing on them. And I know Ola Fink has, has found um, macromiids covered in zebra mussels. They just sit there so long. Here's a, a sprawler that is not a macromiid. It is a gonfid. It's a club tail, Hagenius brevistylus, the dragon hunter. And you can see by this, this picture that its legs aren't quite as long as the, the cruisers, but it does have long legs comparatively to other club tails. But what's remarkable about Hagenius nymphs is that they are such wonderful leaf mimics and detritus mimics. So here's, here's a Hagenius nymph beneath a hawthorn leaf. And um, Hagenius nymphs are found sprawling in the detritus and leaf litter and debris that you find in, against the shoreline of large wave washed, well oxygenated lakes, as well as on the edges of rivers and streams. And they are so cryptic that here's a dip net I took from a river up in northern Wisconsin. It actually has three Hagenius nymphs, final instar nymphs in it. Can you guys find those? I don't know if you can see my arrow, but hopefully you can. Here's one. Here's another. They just look like bark debris and leaves, don't they? And the third one's actually buried, and that's unfair because you can see its head here a little bit. But anyway, point is form follows function there. So just to, to wrap up now, um, when a few other extremes on dragonfly nymphs, what we find uh, here's a, a, an assortment of species from seven different North American families. You can see a wide range of, of divergent characters, their body size, shape, uh, dimensions, the, their, their legs, length of their legs. You can see differences in their antennae and their anal pyramids, posterior lateral spines, things that we have discussed. Um, I just wanted to show you a few extremes. So when we look at size, the largest nymph in that I've ever encountered in North America, although I don't know that it's on record as being the largest, Anex walsinghami is certainly the giant darner. Um, but this comet darner nymph, Anex longipes, literally measured 60 millimeters, six centimeters long. It was huge. And compared to Nanothemus bella, the elfin skimmer, the second smallest dragonfly, I think in the world next to a Japanese species, in final instar is only eight millimeters. Their abdominal shapes can be extremely different from the very flat on the bottom to the, the almost cubist 
um, abdomen of the erythemus on top and everywhere in between. Here's that erythemus on the left. When you take these out of the water and you put them in your hand, they feel like tiny little bricks, just short, um, a bit like Pez candy. If you've ever eaten Pez candy as a child, that's exactly what they feel like between your fingers. But compare its truncated, shortened abdomen with that of a Philo Williamson eye. The, this forcep tail has such an elongated segment 10. And why? Why would a nymph need such a dramatically long um, uh, posterior segment? They even call them tube tails, I believe, because of this. We know that it burrows into softer mud, and some have speculated that this might act as a snorkel. Uh, to allow it to stick that anal pyramid up so it can breathe in, in softer mud where it might sink a little deeper. I've often wondered if it has anything to do um, with jet propulsion, whether having that long tube tail uh, when you push the water out doesn't have so much resistance, kind of like putting your thumb over a garden hose that you, um, that you can't actually, or that you get actual more force, or maybe you can direct it in, and get more specific uh, propulsion away from a predator, who knows? There's a lot of different hypotheses that need to be tested. Here again on, uh, are some abdomens on cross section. You can see how very different they are, but also notice that the one on top has no mid dorsal hooks and no uh, uh, posterior lateral spines. Oftentimes when you don't see any of those, you suspect that it's living in a fishless habitat or a habitat where it is not really struggling with too many predators. In the bottom one, you can see both posterior lateral spines and mid dorsal hooks. Here's um, Agriogonfus tumens, which I, I took in Central America, and you can see right here a very dissuasive hook at the end that I'm certain is going to stop a lot of things from eating this, this particular club tail. I wanted to show you this. This is a bad picture of a second instar epithica or epicordulia princeps, prince basket tail nymph. And you can see on top, it has almost a full complement of mid dorsal hooks already intact as it emerged from the egg. But what's really cool is up on its head, it's got these two prominent devil horns right there. And uh, those are the most significant I've ever seen in any second instar. I, However, when we look at the final instar nymph, although we see large um, posterior lateral spines and extremely large mid dorsal hooks that have grown with the nymph in size, what's amazing is that those two devil hooks on the head have actually not grown proportionately and um, actually have become just kind of uh, vestigial tubercles. So what, what, what is the purpose? They must be protective in that early instar and not so necessary once you start developing really good um, mid-dorsal hooks and posterior lateral spines. And these uh, epitheca nymphs have just extreme, extreme hooks and spines on them. In fact, there's nothing I hate worse than having a handful of epitheca nymphs because it, it literally, it, it, it jabs you and it pokes you and it, it hurts like a mother bear. So they are obviously very good at protecting themselves in their habitats from predators. Tremia lacerata here, you can see it has not only extreme posterior lateral spines, but look at that anal pyramid with very sharp stiletto pointed cerci and epiprox. And um, I've always wondered about this species because I find tremia nymphs oftentimes in fishless ponds with these, these very extreme spines, but in those ponds, they also are competing against a lot of anax and other Asian nymphs. And, uh, and I, I suppose, I don't know this, but I suppose that um, where, where darner nymphs are the top predators, tramia may need to protect itself pretty well. Patterning on dragonfly nymphs can be beautiful. However, you have to be cautious because you, you don't always see the same pattern on the same species every time. 
many cordyleids have this raccoon mask like um, on their head and almost like a, a dinner jacket or vest pattern on their thorax. But just because you see a pattern doesn't mean you will always see a pattern. And so color, color and pattern can be tricky when using them for king dragonflies. Here's a, uh, a, just a smattering of different instars, multiple instars of Anax junius. And you can see how the color and the pattern has changed with age. You can pull many different colors and patterns out of the same um, pond sometimes. So color can be deceptive. And I just wanted to show you as my second to last slide, Leucarinia intacta, the dot-tailed white face, um, flies near my home. And there I pulled seven final instar nymphs a couple of years ago out of the pond in the same general area. And I turned them over and they had, they were all different melanistic forms. The color pattern on the abdomen is so extremely different. But when I got them home and I lined them up under the microscope, it was almost a continuum of the amount of melanin, in, melanin that was placed in this cuticle. For what? Why? How is, this, how is this helpful? What is the reasoning for this when they came from the same pond on the same day in almost the exact location? Is it microhabitat? Is it where they, where they were in that water column? Did they sort themselves out? Um, something that, that Ken and I have discussed at length and, and it's, it certainly needs, more information needs to be um, discovered. And my final slide is just to talk about how now that we've seen the nymphs and we've seen uh, different derived characters and so forth, some of distribution maps can actually be explained uh, when you look at how, how um, the, the habitat that the nymph has evolved in is so, is so particular. And so I think stole this map from the Illinois Natural History Survey, and it just highlights the natural divisions in the state where I live, Illinois. And the fact that the distribution of a species of dragonfly uh, is, is based on two things. In the adult, the, its dispersal behavior, the breadth of its dispersal behavior. But um, for the nymph, the depth of its aquatic niche plays a big role. So when we look at things like the elfin skimmer that does fly in Illinois, it flies in the northeastern morainal division, and it's found at only two fens where we have cold water bubbling up through limestone and, and marl. And, um, and there's probably a, a good reason for why that NIF is found there, and we don't have those kinds of fens throughout the rest of Illinois. When we look at the gray petal tail, Tecopteryx thorii. These nymphs are also found in Illinois, but they're found in East Central Illinois, in the Wabash River area where you've got a lot of um, more karst-like ecology that, or geog what is it, geology, that allows for seepage through rock and these, some, some of the, the hanging, um, hanging wetlands where this, this particular nymph can, um, can survive in moist, uh, moist coverings. And the smoky shadow dragon, Neurocordulia molesta. We don't find that in the central rivers of Illinois. We find it in the large rivers on the, the eastern and, and especially the northeastern border of Illinois, like the Mississippi River, where its nymphs cling to the bottom of rocks and really swift flowing current. And the eastern ringtail or Pedogonphus designatus, that's, that's found in the belly of, of Illinois in what was once the Grand Prairie area where, that has been just flattened and, and the flat rivers are, have, have uh, sand and silt and glacial till left over from the Ice Age. And that's where you find the nymphs. And so um, I think with that, I just wanna acknowledge the people that, um, that have contributed, not just to my knowledge of NIMS, but to my life. And they are Ken Tennyson, who is my mentor in all things NIMS, um, Bill Smith, who is my mentor in all things aquatic uh, invertebrates and, and botanicals, and Steve Valley, who is my mentor in all things odes and photography. And finally, I'd like to thank Carlos, who is my partner in every way imaginable, except in crime, uh, for all of his help always. 
And with that, I'll take any questions.